Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Carlos Rafael was the perfect example of the American dream. Immigrating to the United States in his teens, he worked tirelessly on the docks in a fishing community, rising up the ranks until he saved enough money to buy his own boat, then another boat, and another, until he had his own fleet. In fact, he had built the largest fleet in the Northeast, and one of the largest in the entire country. His net worth was in the millions, and he earned it all through hard work and dedication. Or did he? Rafael's American dream came crashing down in 2016. Federal authorities announced that he was at the center of an investigation involving Russian mobsters, large bags of cash, and fish, a lot of fish. The media quickly nicknamed this brash, hardworking character, the Codfather. My name is Eric Crosby. Welcome to this episode of True. Carlos Rafael was born in the early 1950s on the island of Corvo in the Azores, a Portuguese territory in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. When Carlos was in his teens, his parents were afraid he would be drafted into the Portuguese army and sent to fight in Africa. So they sent him to live at a nearby monastery. Not far from the monastery was an American military base. Rafael often visited the base and fell in love with all things American. He decided more than anything he wanted to live in the U.S. To force his parents' hand, Rafael ran away from the monastery, which got him expelled. To avoid the draft, the Rafael family relocated to New Bedford, Massachusetts. Rafael got his American life. New Bedford is located on the southern coast of Massachusetts, near Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. The area has long been inhabited by the Wampanoag people, but the town of New Bedford was formally incorporated in 1787. It quickly became one of the most important whaling ports in North America, and today is nicknamed the Whaling City. In the latter half of the 19th century, Portuguese immigrants began arriving in large numbers, attracted by the whaling industry. By the time the Rafael family arrived, New Bedford was home to the largest Portuguese-American community in the U.S. This is still true today, with about 30% of the population claiming Portuguese ancestry. Once Carlos Rafael arrived in New Bedford, it was no surprise that he would one day work in the fishing industry. It was, after all, the most lucrative commercial fishing port in America. Rafael enrolled in school, but quickly became bored. He later said, quote, they're telling me dog, cat, fork, knife. He said, quote, I did not come to America for that. I want to make money. After dropping out of school, 
Rafael got a job making linguiça, a type of Portuguese sausage. But like any 15-year-old, he quit within days after being told he couldn't take so many smoke breaks. He later said, quote, Look, the American dream that I wanted wasn't this. To come and make linguiça, and I can't even go for a cigarette after an hour's work? You keep your linguiça, and I'm leaving. His next job was at a textile mill, and lasted a bit longer, just over a year. He had many roles there, including weaver and mechanic. You had to be 18 to work at the mill, but 16-year-old Raphael lied about his age and was hired on the spot. However, New Bedford was a small town, and eventually his age was discovered, and he was let go. Raphael's next job got him into the fish industry. His parents were working in fish houses, and they were making good money, so he decided, why not? His first job was a brutal one, carrying heavy boxes of fish all day, but Raphael was ambitious. Within days, he got a job as an apprentice fish cutter, gutting, cleaning, and deboning fish. According to Raphael, he was so good at it that within months, he was one of the top cutters there. Raphael quickly rose up the ladder, working multiple jobs and learning different parts of the industry. He worked tirelessly, often around the clock. But it paid off, because in 1981, he bought his first boat, and he started his own processing and distribution business, Carlos Seafood. That was the start of what would become one of America's largest commercial fishing businesses. He's a big name in local fishing circles, Carlos Rafael, also known as the Codfather. By 2016, the one boat had grown to a fleet of over 30, a fish house, a warehouse, and control of almost one-fifth of New England's cod market. Rafael's business looked pretty impressive, but when he started out, things were challenging. The fishing industry was struggling. There were low stocks due to overfishing, and this impacted ground fish especially hard. Ground fish are exactly what they sound like, fish that live on or near the bottom of the ocean, including cod, haddock, and flounder. These fish are critical to the fishing industry. The federal government placed limits on the amount of fish that could be caught to ensure populations could rebound. The regulations granted permits, allowing fishermen to catch a certain amount of fish. The amount was based on what you caught in previous years. The result was that fishermen with a lot of boats received more permits, and Raphael had a lot of boats. This became a point of contention within the community. When some of the smaller fishermen suggested caps on the number of permits one person could hold, Raphael expressed his opinion, calling his competitors, quote, mosquitoes on the balls of an elephant and maggots. Despite benefiting from the new rules, Raphael compared federal regulators to the Gestapo. He also said that the new rules would either force business owners to go bankrupt or turn them into outlaws. You can probably guess which route Raphael chose, because we rarely do stories of people quietly packing up shop. Almost as if he was taunting the government, he told federal regulators, quote, I am a pirate. It's your job to catch me. The New York Times eloquently described Raphael as a, quote, blustery, polarizing figure. The local newspaper, South Coast Today, wrote that Raphael is a typical fishing business owner, saying he was, quote, proud, old school, successful, relentless, respected, and with skeletons in the closet. Let's talk about some of his skeletons. Raphael's business faced multiple violations, including fire safety, fishing in a restricted area, and illegally catching fish, one of which was a 900-pound tuna. Nothing out of the ordinary for the guy locals called a character. But it keeps going. Raphael was arrested multiple times. In 1988, he was charged with tax evasion and spent six months behind bars. 
He claimed it was not intentional. He just didn't understand the tax laws. He said, quote, I never deliberately tried to beat the IRS. It's just that I thought, I'm going to make all this money. Someday I got to pay. But I thought I could pay later. Six years later, Raphael was charged with price fixing, but was acquitted at trial. Five years after that, Raphael, along with two others, was arrested for forging sales receipts to qualify for new permits. By 2015, Raphael controlled most of the fishing permits in his sector, but a decision by the Massachusetts government negatively impacted his business. In response, he did an interview with South Coast Today and told the paper that he wanted to sell his business, but only to someone who would take his fleet out of state. Raphael had 37 of 48 trawlers in New Bedford, and if they left, it would devastate the industry. He is quoted as saying, I'm going to cash in and screw. A few months later, there was a knock at the door. Three Russians showed up with a business proposition. A former swimsuit model and naval officer create a body-positive ballet academy that ends up in a cold-blooded killing. A Brazilian supermom starts a cult-like family, adopting 37 children, and then she marries one of them. Then the children team up to brutally murder the husband, who's also the stepbrother? Wondery's new weekly series, Scamfluencers, tells the unbelievable true stories behind some of the world's most infamous scams. From Wondery, co-hosts Sarah Hagee and Sachi Cool unpack what drove these scammers to deceive others and how our culture allows them to thrive. You'll hear how these charismatic and captivating people executed their schemes, conning people out of their money and sometimes their lives. Each season, Scamfluencers will immerse you in the shocking tale of fraudsters, their victims, and what happens when the facade comes crashing down. Listen to Scamfluencers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Claiming to be involved in organized crime, they were interested in Raphael's business and were there to make an offer. Keen to cash in and screw, Raphael set his selling price at $175 million dollars quite a markup from the $25 million he had declared to the IRS in previous years. How did Raphael justify to the Russian mobsters the difference between the official value and the inflated selling price? It was simple. For years, he had been underreporting the value of his catch. Let's go back a bit. The ceiling put on the number of fish that could be caught was different for each type of fish. Those in short supply had lower ceilings and tighter quotas, and in classic supply and demand, these fish, like sole or flounder, were typically more expensive. Fish in large supply had higher ceilings and bigger quotas, but were less profitable. A prime example of this is haddock. It's plentiful, so fishermen were permitted to catch a large number of them. In either case, if you hit your quota, you had to buy shares from another fisherman to keep fishing. The amount of fish caught was self-reported. Sure, a dishonest fisherman could misstate what they caught, 
but there are checks and balances in place to prevent this. When the fish are purchased, buyers are required to validate and confirm what they bought. There's the heart of Raphael's scheme. He reported valuable fish, the ones with the tight quotas, as haddock, and he then sold it to his own distribution house. As the buyer, he then validated his own report. Using this simple loophole, he was able to falsify the records on both ends. Raphael called his process the dance. Let me take you through the steps. The captains on Raphael's boats would call him from the water and say what they caught. They would report some of their catch accurately and send it to the seafood auction. The rest of the catch would be reported as the less expensive haddock. Raphael had millions of pounds of haddock available in his quota, more than he could ever catch. In his business negotiations with the Russians, Raphael said, quote, So I can call any son of a bitch haddock. I rename them, I disappear them. The mislabeled fish were sold to Raphael's distribution company, Carlos Seafood. Raphael falsified the receiving records and bought the expensive fish at the lower haddock market price. The fish was then sold at the correct, higher market price to a broker in New York City who was in on the dance. The broker paid Raphael in duffel bags full of cash, which Raphael ultimately smuggled out of the country to Portugal. As he explained the dance to the supposed Russian crime syndicate, Raphael said, quote, You could become a laundromat. You'll never find a better laundromat than this. In another conversation with them, he said, quote, You could be the IRS in here. This could be a clusterfuck. But he joked that the IRS couldn't possibly have Russian undercover agents, saying, quote, That would be some bad luck. It was bad luck. The three Russians were undercover agents from the IRS and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. First, we are working developing news out of southeastern Massachusetts, an investigation underway tonight. Federal fishing regulators are targeting more uh, parts of his business now. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, wants to remove... There had been rumors for years about Raphael's illegal operation, and his threat to sell his business was the perfect opportunity to investigate. The two organizations determined that Raphael had been lying about both the quantity and type of fish he caught. They estimated that he misreported almost a million pounds of fish. In February 2016, Carlos Raphael was arrested in a raid on his warehouse. Tonight, a Bristol County Sheriff's deputy and the owner of a large commercial fishing business dubbed the Codfather have been indicted in a scheme to falsify fishing records. Carlos Rafael of Dartmouth and Sheriff Deputy Antonio Freitas of Taunton are charged with submitting false records to the federal government in order to get around federal fishing quotas and then pocketing the remaining profits. The indictment says Freitas helped Rafael smuggle some of that money to Portugal. Not one to skirt responsibility, he pleaded guilty in March 2017 to all charges, including one count of conspiring to commit offenses against the United States. He also pleaded guilty to 23 counts of false labeling and misidentifying fish, two counts of falsifying records, one count of smuggling cash, and one count of tax evasion. Raphael said he pleaded guilty because he wanted to, quote, get this over with. Well, Carlos Rafael just admitted his guilt to 28 crimes in connection with his New Bedford fishing business. You may know him as the Codfather. Today in a Boston courtroom, he pleaded guilty to charges related to fraud in fishing quotas and limits. The judge could sentence him up to six and a half years in prison, but the prosecution... Rafael's fishing empire was one of the largest in the country. He's scheduled to be sentenced next week. He was sentenced to 46 months in prison three years of probation, $300,000 in fines, and ordered to forfeit two of his boats. NOAA also suspended the licenses of 17 of Raphael's captains. If anyone violates the terms of their probation, 
they run the risk of being permanently banned from commercial fishing. While in jail, a second lawsuit between Noah and Raphael docked his boats, effectively shutting down his business. Noah wants to revoke dozens of permits for Carlos Raphael and his associates. They also want to increase civil penalties that he'll have to pay of up to more than $3.3 million. Raphael was sentenced last year to nearly four years in prison, pleaded guilty to evading fishing quotas and smuggling money to Portugal. Maine's congressional delegation has sent a letter to the Commerce Secretary asking that 13 fishing licenses forfeited by Carlos Rafael be redistributed across the Northeast and not just be limited to New Bedford. His employees were out of work, and given the importance of his business to New Bedford, this had a significant impact on the town's economy. Fishermen, ice houses, suppliers, and more all felt the loss. The mayor said, quote, There are a lot of people on this waterfront, very hardworking people, whose livelihoods depend on Carlos's landings. Luckily, a settlement was reached quickly. In the agreement, Rafael paid a $3 million fine and was banned from fishing commercially for life. The deal also allowed him to keep the proceeds from the sale of his fleet. The mayor of New Bedford said that the settlement was reached so that the city could, quote, turn the page on the Carlos Rafael saga. The number one industry in New Bedford is the fishing industry. The number one port by dollar gross is New Bedford. The heritage and culture of American fishing is based on our East Coast. The number one port is New Bedford. The number one port that has the infrastructure now is New Bedford. And uh, we have gone through this period of time over the last two years or so where Carlos Rafael was accused of misdeclaring uh, allocations of fish, also a number of other uh, crimes, including uh, income tax, money laundering, many, many uh, counts to an indictment. So now the question is, what's going to happen to his fishing permits, his fleet? And uh, that's been something that people have been uh, talking about now for quite some time. Raphael finished his jail time in June 2020. His probation will be finished in March 2021. Raphael has said that he's looking forward to spending time with his family, splitting his time between New Bedford and his birthplace in the Azores. The Codfather got his moniker because of his massive fishing empire, and you have to appreciate that he built it from the ground up. In a 2004 oral history he recorded for the town of New Bedford, he said, quote, Nothing comes from the sky. I haven't seen anybody on this waterfront do well just by sitting at the end of the pier staring at the sky. Otherwise, I'd be sitting there. With his commercial fishing license revoked, perhaps now he'll have time to smell the salt water and enjoy the view. Sure, this story sounds like it's just Cod versus Haddock, but the impact of Raphael's scheme was wide-reaching. His false numbers allowed his boats to keep fishing illegally, while honest fishermen hit their quotas and stopped. An attorney in the case said Raphael, quote, profited at the expense of other hard-working commercial fishermen by falsifying records so he could keep fishing while they were sidelined. An IRS special agent said, quote, Carlos's false catch reports and tax evasion scheme gave him an unfair advantage to the detriment of honest fishermen and our precious ocean resources. As the largest commercial fishing business in the Northeast, Rafael's overfishing likely had an impact on the fish stocks of the Atlantic as well. A member of the Environmental Defense Fund said, quote, This guy single-handedly impacted the resource.
We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again, and that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die, too. These people don't have anything to lose, and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Dead or alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of True was researched by Haley Gray and written by me. The executive producer is Jason Hoke of Imperative Entertainment. The cover art and design were created by Jenna Sullivan. True was created and is produced by me. Have any comments or questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. A huge thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode. Fred Gomez Carrasco was a notorious drug cartel boss from San Antonio. After years earning millions and running from the cops, Carrasco was serving a life sentence when he decided to break out of the Walls Unit, the oldest prison in Texas. Carrasco and two henchmen took over the prison library. They held teachers and librarians captive as Carrasco bartered for his freedom. Now there's only one way that these people will see the light again. And that's for you to cooperate. The standoff set off one of the worst hostage crises in American history, the 1974 Huntsville Prison Siege. This will be our last day to live if, if, if somebody doesn't come through and help us. They're desperate men and they mean business. He's fixing to shoot me. You know, I'm fixing to die if you don't do something right now. And the rest of us in here are going to die too. These people don't have anything to lose and they're serious. And it's all on tape. Fred, the governor's on for you. The governor wants to talk to you. He can shove it. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Standoff. Better alive, I'm going out. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.